Hi guys, we're back with sessions 23 and this time we're going to talk about meningitis. There is actually a full case study at DearNurses.com since it's impossible to give you all the details in such a short space of time. Here is the case of a patient and the case study reflects this too. Melissa is a 25 year old female who woke up feeling a little confused severe headache and is unable to tolerate light. She is actually displaying the symptoms of meningitis. She's got nuchal rigidity, which means neck stiffness, photophobia, which is an intolerance to light, difficulty extending her leg, which is very classic, and I'll tell you why later. And, of course, the symptoms of meningitis you would expect to find severe headache, nuchal rigidity, photophobia, which is a sensitivity to light, high fever, nausea and vomiting, and there are two classic signs, Koenig's and Brzezinski signs and altered level of consciousness. Let's discuss a little more about Brzezinski's and Koenig's sign, what you would expect to find. Well, in Brzezinski's sign, what you would find is when the examiner flexes the leg, the neck, the knees, and the hips, they all flex at the same time of these patients. Then in Brzezinski's sign, what you would expect to find is the inability to straighten the leg when the hip is uh, flexed at a 90 degree angle because the hamstring muscles, there is an awful lot of tenderness in that area. So it's just not possible to straighten the leg. And of course, like we said with Brzezinski's, it's a little bit more complicated. You've got the knees, the hips, and the neck all in that position where they're in that state of flexion. They all flex at the same time. Now, patients who have a subarachnoid hemorrhage also have the same symptoms, and the reason being it's all related to the irritation of the meninges. Well, what are the meninges? The meninges actually are three coverings which protect your brain, and they go in this order, the pia, the arachnoid, and the dura. If you think of the word PAD pad from inside out, you will remember them very easily. P is the innermost, A comes next, the arachnoid, and D the dura. Inside your brain you have what is called cerebrospinal fluid that is produced in an area called the ventricle and then it circulates around the brain and the spinal column to protect them from injury. What happens with the patient with meningitis? They've either got an infection, they might have inflammation brought on by a virus or a tumor or fungus or some chemical irritant. Typically what happens, treatment will be directed at the cause. If a patient has a bacterial infection, it would more than likely be treated with a drug like clafurin and penicillin. If it's something more of a viral nature, it would be treated with a drug like acyclovar. So treatment will be directed at the cause because there are many different causes for meningitis. One of the problems with patients who develop meningitis, they're at risk for something called a hydrocephalus, which is an unusual accumulation of fluid on the brain. And this is the reason why after long treatment, they put what is called a shunt in a ventricular peritoneal shunt to help shunt that extra fluid around the brain and it goes all the way into the peritoneal cavity outside of the brain so they can have some degree of normalcy. Now let me just talk a little bit about the patient who has meningitis. The patient has meningitis is admitted to the ICU and you can see their diagnostic tests that are done. There's a throat culture that's done in the case of this patient, she's got a fever, which means that her heart rate is going to be a little bit high. That's one of the reasons for tachycardia. Her uh, pulse oximeter is also measuring her oxygen saturation. You can see the nurse here taking care of her needs. Also, blood cultures will be drawn to specifically find out what is the organism causing this problem. Another cause of diagnostic test is um, the lumbar puncture. A spinal tap is done to see specifically what in the cerebrospinal fluid is causing the meningitis. They can isolate the organism. Um, <clears throat> now there is a CAT scan, which you know, nowadays we have CAT scans, which can specifically tell you if there is swelling in the ventricles. So all of these tests ultimately come together. But one of the things that you have to uh, be concerned with when you have a patient with meningitis, <clears throat> patient education is very important because 
families come to visit not understanding what they're doing to the brain. Overexhausting the brain is not good for the brain. Patients who have had meningitis, they're obviously irritable. Remember, they're going to be the ones with the photophobia, bad headaches. Do they need a lot of chaos around the bedside? Absolutely not. So you need to educate your families that they need to let these patients rest. I remember having an incident with a patient with meningitis and high fever. She was in such poor condition, the family would not listen. They were all, they'd spent the whole night around the bedside worrying about fevers and all that stuff. So I finally had a talk with them and expressed to them how important it was to let this patient rest more than just getting their feelings out. So they finally listened and let her rest. And I want you to know that she progressed extremely well, and she did remarkably well. She was discharged without any problems. Another thing that you've got to watch with these patients, too much pain medication. It will decrease the neurological status. When you've over-medicated them because they have severe headaches, because you've not explained to the visitors the need for rest, it becomes a vicious cycle. So try to do everything you can to educate the family, the need for rest, the need for medication, yes, but not to have to overdo it as a substitute for rest. I hope you've learned something from this. Have a nice day. And stay posted for more clinical issues.